just gonna stick it down on your forehead. Is it gone? Yeah, it's hidden now. <laughs> Thanks, mate. It's all right. From a sunny South Africa, welcome to the GCN show. It's the GCN show! <laughs> welcome to the GCN show. Welcome to the GCN show. Coming up this week, motors and disc brakes are both back in the headlines. In tech of the week, we've got a bamboo 3D printed bike, plus we've got an Amstel Gold wrap up as well. And we've got all of your usual favorites. Tweet, caption, comments, wattage bazooka, hacks, bodges, and welcome GCN. You better get on with it. We yeah. have. It's time for wattage bazooka. <laughs> You're supposed to get more enthusiasm than that. I was very thing. enthusiastic. Okay, this week's pro What is Bazooka goes to Dan McClay. Couldn't go to anybody else this last week. Did you see his sprint? Absolutely unbelievable. He won his first pro race at the Grand Prix Dina and came from about 12th place to win over the last 150 metres. He weaved his way like a slalom. It was almost like he's being controlled by someone playing an Xbox or a PS4. It's absolutely incredible. And when you look at Kenny DeHaas' power data, Max effort of 1470, 1071 watts for 18 seconds. And McClay went straight past him. Maximum speed over 70 k per hour. Well deserved. Impressive stuff. Mesmerising. I think I could watch that on infinite loop. Yeah, just incredible. Incredible stuff. Fan watches, presumably. Yeah. Goes to Cormac Nisbet. Ooh, at just 11 years of age, completing a ride up Sacalabra, one of the best climbs on Mallorca, in just 40 minutes. What? I can't do that now. We're going out there this week, aren't we, Lars? Yeah. There's no chance that we're going to beat you, Cormac. So that is thoroughly deserved. Don't forget, if you've got any nominations for next week, all you need to do is use this hashtag, wattagebazooka, on most forms of social media, and we'll find it. Yes, we will. The Bamboo Bicycle Club, in conjunction with Oxford Brooks University, have come up with the world's first bamboo bike that also uses 3D printed technology. So the people at the club have got this vision that eventually, in a not too distant future, members of the public will be able to grow their own bamboo, then 3D print their own lugs, ultimately and effectively being able to make their own frame set at home. They worked with the professors at Oxford Brookes University to come up with the 3D printed lugs, which took around two weeks to develop. And when the lugs are used in conjunction with a special urethane bonding glue and the bamboo, you've got your bike. What could be greener than that? You're doing a green activity and a bike that is possibly better for the environment than a carbon yeah. fibre bike. That's very cool. I know a few people that are going to be very interested in this concept, but you had better start growing your bamboo now. Apparently it takes eight years for the bamboo to be strong enough to be used as bicycle tubing. 2024. Yeah. Matt now, will, Matt's knees will be gone by then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Matt will no longer be with us, unfortunately. <laughs> at at, at I meant. It's time now for hack forward slash bodge of the week. And we're going to start with this one from UK SRFR, who unfortunately broke his Reynolds disc wheel, but not wanting to just chuck it out, fashioned it into quite a fashionable wall-mounted clock. How good does that look? Wall mounted mount using some handlebars. That is very cool. I think a lot of people pay quite a lot of money to have that in their house. Yeah. Hack or bodge, Dan? That's definite hack. It looks amazing. Now this one is a monumental hack. Sticky Bottle tweeted this photo of Matthew Heyman training with a broken arm, supported on a ladder. Yeah, definite bodge actually, I would say, personally. But still, it managed to win him Paru Bay. So it's uh, a bodge, but it hacked his way to it. It was a bodge that worked, that's for sure. Uh, how about this one though from Yoni Shaw? They've sent in a picture of their old bib shorts, which were definitely past their sell-by date, if I don't, if you don't mind me saying. Look at the state of them. But along comes Mum and manages to fix them up with uh, no warranty there, but a spare Nike dry fit compression shirt, and they look like new. How I'd... good is that? Looks so pro. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's a bodge or a hack, though. That's a hack. Definite hack. Yeah. I, lo I love the lifetime mum will fix it guarantee as <laughs> yeah. well. That's pretty cool. Now Ralph has sent this one in. It says unchain my bike. Hashtag GCN hack. And he has used a set of handcuffs to handcuff his bike to the bike rail. Well, I guess if you've got nothing else to use. Yeah, well, I have to take the fluff off mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, quickly moving on. Uh, if you'd like to send us in any GCN hacks or bodges, all you have to do is use the hashtag GCN hack and we shall find it and we're leaving this game. <laughs> 
It is time now for caption competition. You'll remember that last week's photo is this one of Fabian Kentzler rather embarrassingly sliding down the track in Roubaix. We have a very clear winner, although we had plenty of amazing suggestions from all of you. Uh, and that winner is Will Baumer. He says, how do you make a Swiss roll? Push him off his bike. Very good, that did make me actually lol. So very well deserved. Get in touch with us on Facebook and we'll send you out some GCN swag. It's definitely, that's one of the best ones yeah. yet, I think, Dan. Anyway, this week's caption competition photo is this one of Simon Richardson at the Bristol Bespoke Handmade Bike Show. And to start you off, wow, I can actually see a motor in Dan's bike. Can he? That's why he flagged the ride. Yeah. Is that what those glasses are that he's got on? Right, well, I'm sure that you can do better than Larsi, 100% sure. So all you've got to do is leave your captions in the comment section just down below this video. And next week, we'll pick the best one. Last week, following an open letter from Francisco Ventoso of Movistar, the UCI banned disc brakes in the Pro Peloton with immediate effect. Yeah, Ventoso had received some particularly nasty and deep wounds to his leg after a crash at the race in Paru Bay, which he says were caused by coming into contact with a disc brake. Now, if you are at all squeamish, I would suggest that you look away now. Nicholas Mace also claims to have been cut by a disc brake after a crash in the same race at the Arenberg Forest. And for those of you who did just see Ventoso's wounds, then they are particularly frightening. So it's no surprise really that the UCI took some pretty quick action. In a statement following their decision, the UCI stated that it is something they're going to actively look into and continue to investigate with their equipment commission, which includes pro riders, team mechanics, and representatives from the bike industry. The Pro Peloton were quick to back the UCI in their decision, with riders like Alex Dowsett, Adam Blythe, and rider Heshadar and Joachim Rodriguez taking to Twitter to voice their thoughts on the matter, alongside ex-pros like David Miller. Yeah, although a little later on in the day, there were a couple of people who thought that perhaps this decision was slightly rushed. Now amongst those was Team Lamprey Marina manager Brent Copeland, Lamprey being one of the teams who were almost entirely on disc brakes at the Cobbled Classics. He wasn't convinced at all that these cuts to Vento's leg were definitely from a disc brake, speculating effectively that it could have been from something like an aerodynamic bladed spoke. Regardless, you have to say that for the time being, the UCI's decision looks to be a good one. Things like spokes and chain rings are necessary on bikes. There isn't really an alternative, whereas the Pro Peloton has been functioning really very well without disc brakes for years now. Yeah, they have indeed. Uh, now, one team which was affected probably more than any other was Team Rompot Oranje Peloton, uh, the Dutch squad on the run-up to the Amstel Gold Race, probably their most important race of the year. They are one of very few teams that have been on almost entirely disc braked up since the very start of the season. So their mechanics were frantically rushing around trying to prepare bikes for their riders with normal rim brakes before that race. That must have been a total nightmare. This is certainly a very contentious issue. In fact, our Facebook page almost blew up last yeah. week when uh, Matt and Cy discussed it. So what we want to know is your thoughts on the matter. Would you be happy riding in a group where some people were on disc brakes and some people weren't? Let us know down in the comments below. Also back in the headlines this week are hidden motors. Thanks to France Television's Stade 2, who've done something in conjunction with Carrera de la Serra. Now together, they claim that they saw seven bikes being used with hidden motors at the Strada Bianca and Copper Barsi races back in Italy earlier on this year. Now this claim has been made after they used heat detection technology, which was disguised as a camera. Very bold claims, and to back up some of the claims that they made, they interviewed a Hungarian engineer called Istvan Vargas, apologies for the pronunciation, who said that the latest technology isn't hidden in the frames, but is rather hidden in the rims of the wheels, and uses something called neodymium magnets, which can generate an extra 50 watts. Wow. All for the princely sum of 50,000 euros. 50,000? Yeah. It's not cheap, is it? You'd be gutted if you punctured. Uh, now, the programme really didn't have any kind of conclusive proof either way, so we're basically none the wiser as to whether this is widespread in the Peloton or not used at all. They certainly didn't name any names either. But one thing that we definitely know is that with all this speculation and scrutiny on hidden motors in the Pro Peloton, you have to be pretty foolish to use one at a big race. And immoral. Yeah, that too. I think suspicions would be raised if we got in the top 50 of a race time. The Amstel Gold Race took place on Sunday. It's the first of the Hillier Classics of the year and at 247 kilometres long with 34 bergs, pretty tough race. 
Early on, the peloton was led by Team Sky for Michal Kwiatkowski and Orica Green Edge for Michael Matthews. Yeah, but the weather took a turn for the worse, didn't it, halfway through, which did have some bearing on the final outcome. So they came to the foot of the Kalberg for the very last time in a group of just 50 or so, having dropped some really big names, amongst them Kwiatkowski himself, and also three-time winner Philippe Gilbert. Now at that point, Tim Wellers was just hovering off the front. No one really made their move until about halfway up the climb when Gasparotto decided to forge ahead on the attack. Now, the guy from uh, AG2, Jan Bakalantz, tried to go with him, couldn't quite get on the wheel, but ultimately, youngster Michael Vaughan of Tinkoff did manage to get up to Gasparotto. However, it did feel like he was quite satisfied to come second because he basically led Gasparotto in for the final 1500 metres and he actually took quite a comfortable victory for the second time in his career in the end. Uh, Vaughan finished second, of course, and then the best of the rest was Sonny Colbrelli of Bardiani, who finished third after out sprinting the rest of the guys in that break. Interesting, actually, that there were two riders from con uh, pro continental teams on the podium. Yeah, it's good to see, I think, Dan. Mm. And an emotional win, too, for Wanty Group Gobert, uh, Gasparotto's team. He dedicated his victory to the late Antoine de Moitier. Yeah, I think as cycling fans, everyone has got to be pleased to see Wanty Group Gobert and Gasparotto get that. They rode so bravely in the Cobbled Classics, it seems it's a good reward. And Michael Volgren as well, a friend of GCN, and a rider that I know, Dan, you rate very, yeah. very highly. Yeah, I do rate Volgren very high. I think it's just a matter of time before he wins a huge race. Now, in women's cycling, Wiggle High Five have finally managed to get the better of Bulls Dormans at the Uskal Amakumin Bira race in the Basque country. Yeah, they certainly did. So the prologue was won by Cervelo Bilia's Lotto Lapisto, but then Wiggle High Five took three stage wins on the trot, the first two being through Emmy Johansson and then through Georgia Bronzini as well. Now, they did, Bulls Dormans, get a little bit of revenge on the final stage. Megan Garnier won that, but it wasn't enough to topple Johansson, who won the overall title. Good week for them. It's now time for Cycling Shorts. Peter Sagan has announced he's going to take on a couple of mountain bike events, one in the Czech Republic and one in Austria, before the Amgen Tour of California, which is his next road race. Now, let's not forget that Sagan was actually junior world mountain bike champion back in 2008, so the pedigree's there. It's going to be really interesting to see how he gets on, whether or not this becomes a regular fixture yeah. in his annual plans. But personally, I don't know, I can't quite see him doing a Pauline Ferrand Prevot and taking three world titles in cross, mountain bike and road. No, he probably won't get up to Pauline stand, will he? Uh, talking of Sagan though, Pro Cycling Stats came up with some very interesting stats about Sagan. Uh, so they've been looking at how many wins, etc., he's had at his current age compared to other current riders at the very same age. So at the moment, he's got 77 pro wins to his name. The next best is Mark Cavendish, who has six fewer at the same age. Tom Bonin, meanwhile, was 30 fewer. And lastly, and I have just been calculating that we would be on around about 76 fewer combined compared to Sagan at exactly the same age. Uh, now it has to be said that pro cycling stats haven't yet delved all the way back into the Merckx era, so we can't quite compare the true great of cycling with Peter Sagan, but uh, I have to say that Merckx is probably still the best, isn't he? Yeah, it'd also be interesting to see a comparison between Mariana Voss, Lizzie Armitstead, yeah, and um, Pauline Ferrand Prevot there as well. Virtual reality training platform Zwift have announced a really cool competition where one very lucky cyclist will be able to turn pro with the Canyon SRAM team for 2017. Now, participants are going to start in April and May by taking part in a series of one-hour group rides on the platform. Then, from June for the next three months, Swift and Canyon SRAM are going to get put together a few more tests just to really find out participants' skills and talents. Then, finally, in September, 10 very, very select riders will be taken to the Canyon SRAM training camp before the winner is announced. Yeah, worth pointing out that you do have to be female to join the Canyon Stram team in 2017, although I am sure that Zwift will be trying to do exactly the same thing with a men's professional team in the coming years. Uh, now, a quick word for Fabio Fellini, the Trek Sega Freda rider who started Amstel Gold on Sunday as one of the pre-race favourites but didn't actually really ever get to the start because in the neutralised zone he had an awful crash, some of you may have seen it already. Basically it looked like he was fiddling with something down by his skewer and then got his hand trapped between the spoke and the fork which then catapulted him over the bars flat on his face so let's go to hospital and get some facial surgery. Thankfully he did tweet, tweet later on that evening that he was okay all things considered but we of course wish you a speedy recovery Fabio. Very glad to hear he's okay, because it means it's almost all right to make a joke about saying at least there weren't disc brakes there, and to point out that 
playing with something on your forks or your front wheel whilst riding along is a lesson that yeah. you only yeah, really need to learn. Yeah, probably the best once. idea to do that, even as a pro. A company called Speedex have announced they've absolutely smashed their Kickstarter fundraising target of fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, they have raised an incredible two million dollars with still a couple of days remaining, making it already the largest ever bike funding Kickstarter project. Now, Speedex claims to be different because it's the world's first ever smart aero bike. They've got a computer with a built-in GPS, the computer's built in too, and apparently some coaching software called Xcoach, which includes global ranking. It's going to be very interesting, and actually, I'd quite like to know if any of you have invested or bought Kickstarters mm. in Speedex. So well, we've certainly had a lot of interest, that's for sure. Uh, we'll finish cycling shorts this week, though, with some news from IKEA the Swedish furniture giant have said on Bike Biz that they will be soon selling bikes, at least to customers in the UK. Apparently they're going to retail for around four to five hundred pounds, which is around seven or eight hundred dollars. Uh, so perhaps not quite such a low price point as some people might have been expecting. Uh, it remains to be seen just how clear the instructions are going to be on how to build them up. Yeah, I own four bits of furniture and they're all IKEA. Yeah, hopefully all you need is an Allen key and a mallet. And you'll be good to Press go. Press fit bottom brackets will be simpler, won't they? done. Dom has chosen just one tweet for Tweet of the Week this week, but it is a cracker. Bob Jungels, who you may or may not know is the Luxembourg national champion, tweeted this following the Amstel Gold Race. Dear Dutch fans, thank you very much for all your support, but I have to disappoint you. I'm not at Nicky Terpstra. Winky smiley. I can see why people got confused. They do look quite similar, don't they? It's in the blue, isn't it? The blue's blue. Yeah, there's a, there's a faint difference, but it's not obvious. At speed, definitely not. As always, you have all been on fire in the comments section. Yeah, we've had so many comments this last week, it's been very hard to keep up with them all, but a few that stood out to us. Firstly, from Tom Howard, who beneath the latest video with Hannah Grant, Matt Stevens, and also Sean Kelly said, I'm so waiting for this to happen. Matt, is there anything I can do, Hannah? Hannah, yes, the washing up. And she will definitely say that next time, won't she? We'll make sure of it. It's gonna happen. I like this one from our mates at the Global Mountain Bike Network underneath the collaboration video. You, you might have liked it, I didn't. Said, never in doubt, Neil is the GCN versus GMBN wheelie king. How, I mean, how did they decide that? I don't I think Quite they did. way better. Video. Uh, meanwhile, Kuski78, also underneath that same cookery video, said, Matt is pouring beer just like he clips into the pedals. I'm th quite sure I agree with that because he actually did manage to pour the beer. Uh, conversely, he very rarely manages to clip into any pedals, so. I'm going to have to wait about three quarters of an hour for that to go down. Oh, for... <laughs> We've got a great week ahead of us on GCN, so here is what we have coming up. On Wednesday, we've got five killer sessions to help you before your next sportive. Group rides are also fantastic for teaching you new skills that could you save you energy on the day of your event, even if you're not actually any fitter at all. So gradually you're going to learn the best place to sit on the wheel to gain maximum benefit from slipstreaming. And you're also going to gradually gain confidence in getting right up close to the wheel in front of you or sitting right in the middle of a group. And that, on the day of your event, is going to save you bundles of energy on the flatter sections. On Thursday, we've got five ways that cycling can change your life. And on Friday, we've got a feature that we filmed with Team Sky. Yeah, out in the training camp in Mallorca, that's one to look forward to. Uh, Saturday is the first truck tour that we've done for quite some time. This time, last, he takes a look around the Cofidis team truck. And then on Sunday, it is episode number nine in Ask GC Anything as it's now known. And then on Monday, we have got a new maintenance video, how to scratch proof your bike with Cy Richardson. If you've got a bit of a penchant for epic gravel riding, then you might wanna go one step further because there are certain areas of the bike that are gonna be really susceptible to stone chips. So the down tube here, and then also the seat tube here. So what you're looking to do again is to apply some clear protective tape that is gonna add another barrier against stone chips. And on Tuesday, it's the GCN show. We've got a request. We want to see some more hashtag welcome GCN introductions. Oh, yeah. Get all your mates together, hashtag welcome GCN on things like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and you could be on the show introducing it next week. We've had some just brilliant submissions over the last few weeks. So go back, take a look at a few previous GCN shows and get some inspiration. Hello, Hello from, from North, North Cyprus. Welcome, welcome to the GCN show. Time now for Extreme Corner. This week we have got this video of Johan Borelli absolutely smashing the cycling cross bike. Almost literally.
I've got a feeling you might be making a clock out of one of those wheels in the not too distant future. It's not going to be a fully circular clock though, it's only going to do part of No, like maybe daytime, day. daytime only. Well, that's about it for this week's GCN show. If you have enjoyed the video, please do hit share and give us a thumbs up too. If you'd like to see another really cool video where Simon has a look around SRAM's Taiwanese manufacturing facility, click right there. On the other hand, if you'd like to see the video we mentioned earlier where I teach GMBN's Neil Donoghue how to wheelie a road bike, that is just down there. And to subscribe to GCN, click about here.